Good evening, everyone, and welcome. And thank you for joining us tonight for our, our Black History Month session, Black Excellence in STEM Careers, Diversity in Engineering. My name is Alicia Gabidon, and I am an adult services librarian with Vaughan Public Libraries. Before we start the program, I would like to share a few housekeeping notes. To minimize interruptions, participants will be set to mute and all videos will be turned off. For accessibility, we have turned on the live transcript feature. A question and answer period will follow the presentation. Questions can be sent in at any time via the chat function and are moderated by the co-hosts. This session is being recorded and will be made available on VPL's YouTube channel. This evening, I am pleased to welcome Gary Thompson, who is an electrical engineer and energy specialist, PNG. Gary is an experienced energy professional with over 30 years of experience. He is recognized as a leader, strategic thinker, and grid modernization innovator. His experiences include the management and development of energy solutions related to the planning, transmission, and distribution of electricity grids. Thank you very much for joining us this evening, Gary, and I hand it over to you. Thank you, Alyssa, and good evening, everybody. As Alyssa said, my name is Gary Thompson, and um, for the last 30 plus years, I've had the privilege of working as a practitioner, as an electrical engineer, practitioner within the Dominion of Canada, specifically in the province of Ontario. <clears throat> I originally hailed from Jamaica, where I got the foundation that um, had me uh, propelled in the direction of technology, of engineering, of innovation. So my plan tonight is to share with you a perspective of engineering from the from, through the lens of diversity um we're gonna talk about how you know stem uh science technology engineering and math as the framework we're going to talk about some of the things that are involved in in stem defining stem uh some of the requirements but more so focus on engineering um talk a bit about my background not too much um but hopefully it'll serve as a source of encouragement for those who are viewing us today who would like to pursue a field in technology or in engineering and then i'll be introducing a couple of organizations that i am a part of or have been affiliated with and i think it's important that we understand where organizations stand when it comes to diverse people, when it comes to um, having African Canadians as part of their, their practice field. Today, I'd like to dedicate my presentation to an amazing woman. She left us on, on the weekend. Her name is Catherine Elaine Thompson, BSc in Biochemistry, Bachelor's of Nursing, Master's of Nursing, 1964 to June, 9, June to February 19th, 2023. A wife, a mother, a graduate nurse, clinical practitioner, an educator. Catherine was a clinical coordinator in the area of general surgery at one of the largest teaching hospitals in downtown Toronto. She, she's an award-winning clinical tutor for uh, students in the medical field, particularly nursing. And also she is a award-winning uh, group member for groups that have published patient support material um, at her hospital. So 
I do this in her honor. Um, she was my partner for 34 years and she will be sadly missed. So our agenda for today, as I said, we're gonna define what STEM is, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. We're gonna talk a little about Gary Thompson. Who is he? Then I could not do this presentation without talking a bit about the historical aspects of blacks in STEM. We're gonna go way back and we're gonna take it to the future, to the present. We're gonna look at why do we have STEM as a career? Why would we be interested in STEM as a career? There's certain things that are happening around the world that when you really look at it, it, it it's probably one of the most exciting fields that someone could ever embark on. Uh, we're gonna deal with basic common requirements and throughout the presentation, we're going to talk about the careers and the university versus college. So what is STEM? Science, technology, engineering, math. STEM, as it's shortened, is an educational program that has been developed to prepare primary and secondary students for college, graduate study and careers in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and math. STEM is an educational program that's focused at preparing individuals. In addition to subject-specific learning, in addition to preparing, STEM aims to foster, STEM aims to encourage inquiring minds, encourage thinking, and encourage people to work together. STEM can only be productive if we have people who are willing to work together and people who are willing to give some thought to the world around them. You know, as, as individuals, we have two choices in life. We can walk through this world in a straight line and never really know where we're going or what's happening around us. Or we can look left or we can look right, look up and look down. And every time we look in a direction, we ask ourselves a simple question. What is going on? What is happening? Simple questions like that can lead to other questions and other questions. And then before you know it, we have an inquiring mind that starts to think about why? The question, why? Why is that happening? Why does that look like that? So that's what STEM is. It's preparation and it's fostering and encouraging. So let me talk about Gary Thompson. So as I mentioned, I'm from Jamaica. Over here, you have a picture of my, we call them elementary schools here. But I grew up in a community called Harbor View, and that's a harbor. That is the entrance of the Harbor View Primary School. And it took us from up to grade six. And then at grade six, we entered high school. Now I am I feel really privileged because this institution, St. George's College, is over 170 years. What is significant about St. George's College is that it is known for its science-based education, chemistry, biology, and physics. Here, definitely, we were prepared through the rudiments of science for future, um, for future uh, careers. But not only that, it, we were, our minds were fostered, our minds were motivated and our minds were encouraged. And because of that, because of that 170 year plus tradition in educating minds, I moved on to the University of Technology where I gained my diploma in electrical engineering. That was a three year program. When I left University of Technology, I worked in Jamaica for a number of years 
in, 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 um, in the electrical engineering field, working with large industry, large food processing, airports, and that sort of thing. After a couple of years of working in Jamaica, where I got my diploma in electrical engineering, that diploma, by the way, is equivalent to an associate's degree in Canada. I, I, I came to Canada. I came to Canada. At the time, it was called Ryerson University. Today, it's called Toronto Metropolitan University. I was privileged there to study for four years where I gained my Bachelor of Technology in Electrical Engineering. Now, something else that I'll talk about later, which I'll touch on here. Engineers are expected to have a dual role. It's not all about math and science. It's not all about grease, you know, metals and, and electricity and chemicals. But you are expected, there's an expectation. And the expectation is that you are valid, you put position yourself as valid contributing members of society. While at Toronto Metropolitan University, I took the opportunity to be involved in the African and Caribbean Students Association. And it was during those days that I was privileged to work with good brothers, good sisters, good people from all stripes towards making the life of the black students at Ryerson, now Toronto Metropolitan University, to be a much better experience on campus. And that's something that today, when I look back, is something that is an achievement that I'm very proud of. So I left Toronto Metropolitan 10 years after that. I decided I needed to continue my studies. At the time, I had a choice. Do I do graduate studies, master's studies in engineering or business? The way things looked at the time, I had already done 10 years in engineering. What I needed to round off my career was that business degree. So I studied at York University, the Schulich School of Business, where I attained a master's in business administration. Coming out of that, 10 years later, I made a decision that I was gonna go back and get a Master's of Science in Energy. At that time, Canada was getting into the renewable energy space, wind turbines, solar energy. And I felt that if I was gonna continue, I wanted to go in that direction. What better way to equip me than to study the rudiments of energy, the rudiments of uh, renewable energy, and then I got my master's in, in science, science and energy. Today, as Alicia said in my profile, I'm involved in energy. I'm involved in generation, distributed energy resources. I'm involved in microgrids. But the one that piques my interest that I am becoming greatly involved in is the whole issue of sustainability. Recognizing that our planet is challenged, that the environment of our planet is challenged, that we need to reduce our carbon footprint. We need to reduce the greenhouse gases that are warming our, our planet. So actively today, that's one area that I'm proud to say I'm involved in and making a positive contribution to our planet. Throughout my career, I have been steeped in innovation. What that has involved is Gary Thompson being involved in a lot of firsts. And I thought I'd share some of those examples with you because when your mind is fostered to think, when you're when you're encouraged to question, to ask the question why, and you look around you, then one of the things that emerge is that you want to improve 
what you see around you. So as part of my interest in sustainability, in um, reducing of carbon and greenhouse gases, I've been involved in the, significantly in the area of in the recent years of energy storage. The project here is the first of its kind in the world. And it's a project I was involved in and it was based on Toronto Island where we had bags under the, the, under the lake and in the night we would pump air into those bags. During the day, when the cost of energy was high, we would read by the, because of the pressure or using the pressure of the water, we would push that air back through a generator and use that generator to reduce the energy consumption of the city of Toronto. What that did, so instead of the city of Toronto consuming uh, carbon producing, greenhouse gas producing uh, uh, electricity. The electricity was coming from compressed air under the lake. This project has been so, was successful. It was the first of its kind in the world. And today it's gone on to be the parent for much, much larger projects as far afield as Australia. Last week, uh, there, was a, there was an announcement, um, I believe with First Nations using energy storage again to as an avoidance, as a new, way, new source of energy to reduce carbon and greenhouse gas production on our grid. So that was something that was, that was very exciting and I was happy to be involved in. The other one up here is battery storage. And what you see here is an energy, it's a battery on a pole. This was used to, re, to provide emergency support for communities when there was a power outage. Also, it's used to support the charging of electrical vehicles. This was the first of its kind again in the world and it received a National Innovation Award from the Canadian Electrical Association. That, as we say, that's big things, big things. This also had an award, the company got an award for it, but this one is something that I'm personally proud of because I, I've been fielding calls from as far away as China of people who want to do the same thing. Um, Australia, uh, Europe, because it is so useful, it is so significant. Last but not least, something that you're probably all familiar with, the Eglinton Light Rail Transit Project. Initially, the backup generation was going to be provided by carbon producing greenhouse gas emitting natural gas generators. The community came out and said they didn't want it. I am proud to say that I was part of the group that through ideation, we were able to emerge with a battery energy storage solution that was clean, non-emitting, and no greenhouse gas production. So the Eglinton light rail transit backup is now lithium ion energy storage batteries as compared to what was originally envisioned, which was carbon producing, greenhouse gas producing generation. Again, this, when it was, um, when it was uh, started, it was the largest transit-based energy storage project in North America at that time. So three projects, three innovation projects that I'm very happy that I was a part of um, award-winning projects. And there is no reason why any uh, young person on this, call, on this, on this um, seminar cannot achieve those same heights 
cannot be an innovator in their own right and create things that are not only technically challenging, but are good for the community, good for the planet, good for the environment. So I wanna talk about diversity in engineering. That was the topic that was on the front. What is diversity in engineering? Today, we, we, you know, we, we throw terms around, we, we match words together. And I don't know, sometimes I wonder if we really understand what we're saying. But I'm gonna propose a definition here, which I'd like you all to consider. Diversity in engineering, it's the engaging of the best minds in the profession. If you're studying technology, if you're studying engineering, you are considered a part of the STEM profession. You're considered a part of the engineering profession. And that profession includes women, Black people, Asian and South Asian people, Indigenous people, 2SLGBTQIA plus people, internationally educated professionals. All of these come together to make the engineering profession in Canada, in Ontario, one of the most diverse fields that we have in the, of, of any profession. The group that, that looks over engineering in Canada is called Engineers Canada. And they have a strategy for diversity in engineering. And I thought it prudent that I share that with you. It's important that this organization recognizes diversity and inclusivity because it is from this organization that flows the approval of the engineering programs, the approval of the engineering disciplines. And, you know, they say that the stream is as good as the head of the stream. Engineers Canada is the head of the stream in engineering in Canada. And Engineers Canada's diversity and inclusivity work is driven to deliver relevant activities, services, and initiatives for individuals at various stages of their engineering career. So Engineers Canada is not only interested in when you start or those who are practicing. It looks at individuals in school. It tries to assist them in finding their love for science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM subjects. It encourages choice. It encourages individuals to study engineering at the university level. And when those engineers graduate, it's very important that they are encouraged to continue in engineering. And that's one of the key things that Engineers Canada does ensuring that they remain within the provision profession to become experienced engineers, but not only experienced engineers, and this is a theme that you'll see me touch on as we go through this presentation, engineering leaders. Our society needs responsible, disciplined leaders. And I will say to you, a profession in engineering is one of the greatest ways for someone to rise to that challenge, to become a disciplined professional leader, not just of engineering, but of society. And I just wanna share something with you. Um, my technology was working and it died on me, so I have to go back to the basics. We're gonna talk a bit about science and the history of science. And I thought it important that we see that science and technology is not a recent phenomenon. It goes back to time. It goes back over 3,500 years. 3,500 years in the continent of Africa. Scientific proof today points to the origins of science and technology 
in the continent of Africa. And for those individuals here of African descent who are considering what to do with their lives, my hope is that through sharing things like this, through this presentation, in Black History Month, you will, you will gain encouragement to move forward, to take up that challenge, to become good professional engineers, good professional technologists. Let's see what this has to say. Welcome to We Love Africa. In today's video, we look at the top five ancient African inventions that first originated in Africa. Number five, astronomy. The world of astronomy has largely been associated with the West, though with recent studies and discoveries, researchers and archaeologists have come to the conclusion that Africans were the first astronomers. The Dogon people of Mali, who had the most advanced mode of discovery, had accumulated knowledge and information on Saturn's rings, Jupiter's moons, the spiral structure of the Milky Way, and the orbit of Cyrus's star system. Number 4. International Trade when you hear of trade and globalization, we see it as a very recent agenda that has been built to unite the world and make us one global village. Perhaps you even associate it with Europe and America due to the harsh realities of the transatlantic slave trade. Regardless of wherever you are in the world, you will be interested to learn that international trade first started in ancient Africa, with numerous evidence pointing to the first international trade between Africa and Asia that allowed exchange of ideas, goods, and cultural practices that built the foundation of the earliest civilizations of ancient Africa. Number 3. Mathematics Indeed, before the likes of Albert Einstein, Isaac Newton, and Atal, mathematics did originate from ancient Africa and is placed firmly in African prehistory. The discovery of the Lebombo bone that dates back to 35,000 BC in the Lebombo Mountains of Swaziland proves that many of the mathematic concepts that we learn at school were also developed in Africa. Other great discoveries were found in ancient Egypt that include scripted tablets or textbooks about maths that included division or multiplication of fractions and geometric formulas to calculate the area and volume of shapes. Number 2. Medicine Yes, ancient Africans did have medicine and advanced medicine practices, despite what the media or history tells us today, and to this day many of the treatments are still in use in modern medicine. With the earliest known surgery performed in Egypt around 2750 BC, many of the medical procedures were performed in ancient Africa before they were performed in Europe. These procedures included vaccination, autopsy, limb traction and broken bone setting, bullet removal, brain surgery, skin grafting, removal of dental cavities, installation of false teeth, also what is known as caesarean sections, anesthesia, and tissue carcerations. Number 1. The Light Bulb The world's greatest invention first originated in ancient Africa. The Dendera Light Bulb, or also known as the Egyptian Light Bulb, has and continues to have a lot of controversy regarding its potential as an ancient African technological artifact, with its origins from the best preserved ancient temples in Egypt and its connection to the Egyptian goddess Hathor at Dendera. This artifact has archaeologists puzzled and confused if the ancient Egyptians actually created the first light bulb that was powered by the Baghdad battery and that could only have been made possible through international trade. Question. With the pandemic still taking place and the COVID-19 virus continuously evolving, if this was ancient Africa, do you think we as Africans would have found a cure and been the main suppliers of the vaccine through ancient African international trade methods or routes? What are your thoughts? Thank you so much for watching. Even if you, had, if you looked at the screens, it would have been um, clear that there was significant advancement in science and technology. One of the last things you saw was a light bulb. Ancient arch archeologists have found batteries, old batteries in digs in Egypt and other parts of North Africa. And it's, it's become known that using vinegar, and vinegar is a product, is a byproduct of fermented fruit juice. So any type of juice that contained natural sugar, if left long enough with a little uh, chemical in encouragement, creates vinegar. And vinegar can act as a very 
good natural byproduct that produces electricity with the right ap application of wires. I won't get into that, so it'll, it's actually quite exciting. But what is more exciting is the fact that over 3,500 years ago, the things that we see today as, as emerging modern technologies was something that our ancestors actually um, championed and mastered. So with that in mind, let's move forward and let's continue the historical perspective. I've created two slides um, because I want to encourage everyone, both male, female, and, 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 and others, to really consider STEM as a viable career, to really consider focusing more on engineering. We have Shirley Jackson fiber optics. Some of you may hear about Bell. You see the Bell ads. Bell has fiber optics. Um, caller ID, call waiting, solar cells. It was this engineer, Shirley Jackson, that actually developed this technology. Today, we do a lot of stuff on the internet. We have just emerged out of a pandemic where there was a lot of schooling done, a lot of Zoom calls, a lot of for those of us in, in, in the profession had a lot of Zoom meetings and that could only have been possible without Dr. Marion Crook because she developed what's known as voice, V-O-I-P, VoIP, voice over IP technology. She also developed the tech, texting. Many of us love to text. Thanks to this woman, we can do that today. I'm sure you've all seen the movie Hidden Figures. That is one of the most un, uh, one of the best, one of the most untold stories of achievements in our society. Three women, gifted scientific minds, who are integral in the developing of the math behind the launching of the first space missions in the U.S. Without these women. Those rockets would not have been launched. We would not have had a space shuttle. We would not have had the advances that we've had today. And then last but not least, not leaving out the medical side of the business, Dr. Patricia Bath, an ophthalmologist, uh, an inventor of a new technique for cataract surgery. Um, as you get older, sometimes uh, you're, you're, there's a growth on your eyes that with the use of lasers, they can correct it and bring your vision back. This woman was an individual who created a technique for doing that. What do all these uh, six women have in common? They're of African descent. They're black women who have done well, who have asked the question, why? There is no reason why those of you out there who are looking at what to do next with your life cannot join them by asking the question, why? And by answering that question, making our planet a better place. Not to leave out the other inventors. Louis Latimer collaborated with Thomas Edison and Alexander Graham Bell, two of the pillars of the technology that, that enables our life today. The modern light bulb, uh, the Bell telephone, um, railroad car water closets, otherwise called toilets. So when you take a train today, and if there's a toilet, if you take the GO train, if you take the VIA train, and there's a toilet in there, thank Lewis Latimore for that convenience. Those of us who, all of us have seen traffic lights, the three light traffic light, the red, the amber, and green. Well, Mr. Garrett Morgan in 1923 developed the three light traffic system. Before he came on board, you had to have a policeman at every intersection um, directing traffic. And if the intersection wasn't important enough, it was left up to the good behavior of the drivers. You can imagine the, le the, re the level of accidents and how dangerous it was to drive without traffic lights. 
everyone here uses elevators. Alexander Mills in 1887 developed something that we take for granted, the automatic elevator door. When we, go into, when we push the button to go up or down, and that door opens automatically, it's because Alexander Miles asked the question, why? Going back into the biology and chemistry of things, Harold Amos, an African-American microbiologist and professor, taught at Harvard Medical School for over 50 years. And he was the first African-American department chair of the school. I, initially, I talked about engineers, scientists being leaders. Here we have a classic example of a man who asked the question, why? And by answering that question, he was able not only to be a great scientist, but also to be a leader in science. Last but not least, many of you are looking at a computer screen. That computer screen owes its origination to Mark Dean. He developed the first color IBM monitor. So whether you have a flat screen or you have a screen on your laptop, you, we have to give, give uh, kudos to Mark Dean because he was a co-inventor of that technology. People, we are a proud people. We are a people that have tradition. We're a people that have success. We're a people that have achieved. We have showed great shoulders to stand on. And I would encourage you all not to ignore, but to ask the question why. And hopefully in asking that question why, and by considering some of these examples that you've seen, you can move forward to be great people making a great com contribution, not just to your household, not just to your city, not just to your country, but to your planet. Marcus Garvey, one of the greatest thinkers of, of uh, in, in the Pan-African movement said, never forget that intelligence rules the world and ignorance carries the burden. Therefore, remove yourself as far as possible from ignorance. How do we do that? We ask the question, why? And seek as far as possible to be intelligent. How do we be intelligent? We ask the question, why? And we answer the question, why? So by asking the question, why? You now ask yourself, why do, again, why STEM as a career? Why should anyone consider science, technology, engineering, or mathematics as a career? Well, those who are to study in the STEM field actually solve real world problems. If you're a problem solver, you're seeing as someone who is contributing positively to our society. And that's what STEM professionals do. They have problems. They ask the question, why? They solve it. They, go, they think about it. And they create solutions. The other thing is innovation. So I was able to share with you three, three innovation projects that I had the privilege of, of being involved in. And I look forward to being involved in many, many more innovation projects. But innovation is becoming more important. Our society, and I'll show you later on, how innovation is related to the growth in the population in the world. The safety, the security, and the ability to live in this world is rooted in the rate at which we innovate. STEM professionals take on leadership roles in major technological transitions. Our world continues to go through a transition. 
many, many years ago when the first cell phone came out, it used to be called the brick because it was as big as a brick that they used to build houses. Nowadays, we have cell phones that can fit in the palm of our hand and that are as light as a couple of sheets of paper. That is leadership. That is, is the transition that we've come through. And we're getting to the stage where that cell phone is now no longer something we hold in our hand, but it's something that can be in our watch. I'm sure many of you out there, you have an Apple watch, you have a smart watch or a fit Fitbit. That in itself is a major technological transition. Last but not least, STEM, specialization in STEM is continually evolving with new discoveries. Computer engineering, biomedical engineering uh, are all fields that did not exist uh, 10 years ago. But because we're in, we're con in a continuous changing environment, okay? We're in a continuous changing environment. You look at sports, we're able to, to, to shoot basketballs faster. Why? Because we have new technology uh, to make new shoes, better shoes that allow us to run, that allow us better traction on the court, that make balls that are better basketballs or baseballs. Or yesterday we had the Super Bowl. So if you look at the guys on the field, how they run, the very way they run and throw is all part of a technological transition. So it's continuing to evolve. Let me tell you, this is a very, very exciting part of, our, of the world. And I'm inviting you to be a part of it, to be a part of the evolving technological transitions. This is the graph I spoke about, right? Down here, you have time from negative 9,000 years ago up to say about 2020 right here. Up here, we have the population of the world. We can see that at about 500 million, there was very little innovation happening in our society. As we started to go past that 500 million, things started to steeply increase. The, the engine was, was introduced. The airplane, we had the industrial revolution. And as we go up, penicillin, we start talking about DNA at about 4,000 million people. Nuclear energy at about 4,500 4, people. Computers at about 5,500 people. Internet, mobile technology, landing men on the moon. We're up to about 6,000 6, million people. As the population grows, so does the technological transition grows. So does the need for more individuals to become involved in engineering, in technology. More individuals and those of us of African descent have a legacy to stand on, have a legacy to drive us because our ancestors, our forefathers, we're doing it. And it's, the baton is being passed to us to now ask the question, why? And answer that question to make our society a better place. So what are some of the skills that are essential for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics? Inquiry-based problem solving. These are the things that they don't, you don't take an exam. These are things that you develop as you practice. Being curious, that is something that we are born with. Everyone's curious, you know? 
Everyone's curious. Everybody wants to know why. We ask the question why. And as we ask the question, we start to think about what are some of the responses to the question why? That's analytical reasoning. But it really is just sitting down and thinking about it. When you light a match and the match strikes and you see the flame and you ask the question, why are there different colors in that flame? When you see a plane overhead, you ask yourself the question, why? That, why is that plane able to stay up there in the air when that plane is really heavy, thousands of kilograms? And as we think about it, we begin to need tools to help us better understand the, the, the thoughts that we're coming out with. We need tools to help us to investigate more. And that's another term for that is scientific com computing. We see that today in data analytics, it's a very, very emer a large emerging popular field. Use what you learn in school to solve problems. Last but not least, we get into the soft, what's called soft skills. So we looked at being curious, why? We looked at trying to think about an answer for the question why. And we look at the tools that we're taught in school to help us answer the question why. But how do we communicate our answers? I have met many people early in the profession who are very smart, brainiacs or nerds as they call them. I'm a nerd, but they have one challenge and it's a challenge to communicate. It's a very, very important skill. Being able to communicate with your brethren, with your boys on the corner or with your people in a class is one thing. But when you're required to communicate your answers to the question you asked why, it's a different thing. It's a very, very important skill. There are two ways to communicate. There's verbal communication and written communication. So, you know, people say, well, English is not important. Being able to speak properly, or I'm aging myself here when I say speak properly, but you mean being able to verbally communicate your ideas or in writing is extremely important. I'll tell you how important it is. A lot of software applications today help you in your communication. It actually, as you type, as you speak, it works ahead of you and it predicts what you're gonna say such that you're able to communicate that people can understand. If it wasn't that important, I can tell you, individuals would not have asked the question why and come up with this tool. And last but not least, what I'm doing here today is a presentation. I learned very late in my career how important presentations are. So I'll suggest to you, you need to be able to present not just your answers to the question why, but you need to be able to present who you are as an individual, as an African Canadian, as a South Asian Canadian, as a two LGBTQIA plus individuals, very important that you are able to communicate who you are. We have to think ahead. Thinking ahead is extremely important. It's being predictive. It's being able to look beyond, to anticipate, 
So as you think of the answer to the question, why? You can anticipate. And last but not least, we talked about leadership. Our society needs strong leaders. I would suggest to you that because of our historical legacy, because of the strong shoulders of the likes of the people of Marcus Garvey that we stand on, we have the capability to be the leaders in our society, to create that society that is safe, that is carbon free, and that has no greenhouse gases, where people can breathe and be healthy. So with all that skill in mind, I wanna just touch on the subjects that you would need in the various, whether it was science, technology, engineering, and math. As we look at science, there are the four subjects, biology, chemistry, physics, math. Now, I am the first to say that, or I, I, I'll, I'll be the first to put my hand up to say that it's, none of these subjects are easy. None of them are easy. When I first started into them, I had a very, very hard time. But what did I learn? It's not about how hard the subject is. It's about your curiosity. It's about your willingness to sit down and spend time. To sit down, and you guys are probably going to be tired of hearing me say this, but to sit down and ask the question, why? Why does blood flow in the direction that it flows? Why are leaves green? Why can we see through these things we call eye eyeballs? or chemistry, what makes up table salt? Why is water wet or is it always wet? Sometimes it's frozen. Sometimes it's a gas we call fog or we call mist. Why? And then there's a physics. How does the sunlight strike something like a glass pane and creates energy. How do we have solar cells? How does man, has man been able to create nuclear energy? And last but not least, math. One plus one equals two. How do we take that and move into things like calculus, like algebra. Again, it's not about it, the fact of it being, it's not about the fact of it being um, hard, but it's more about, are we willing to spend the time to ask the question why? Technology is, you know, as we said, we're, we're, we're in a, uh, an age of evolving technology. So nowadays, there's classes in things called digital modeling, prototyping. It's a huge thing about in innovation. Mobile technology, mobile technology, phones, smartwatches, laptop computers. You all heard about 3D printing. 3D printers, computer programming. I mentioned earlier data analytics, the internet of things. How is the internet helping us to do the things that we need to do in society? Machine learning, having machines that are intelligent enough to operate on their own. And last but not least, you need no introduction to this. It's gaming, game development. All of these are specializations in the field of engineering and technology today. And I would submit to you 
that in five to 10 years, they will be obsolete and be replaced by other evolving technologies. Engineering. The branches of engineering, there's civil engineering, buildings, roads. If you like to build, if you like to build things out of, it's out of paper, out of wood, out of clay, civil engineering is, might be something you're looking at. Electrical engineering, computers, how do we provide power? The power that's power in this presentation right now, where is it coming from? It's because of electrical engineering. Mechanical engineering, many of our buildings are heated by hot water, by steam. Those radiators that the water passes through, where did that come from? How did that develop? Chemical engineering. Chemical engineering talks, deals with uh, using the chemicals of our earth to create useful compounds, like taking oil out of the ground, creating gasoline, creating um, plastics, all come out of chemical engineering. Computer engineering, developing smarter, smaller, more agile computers. Biological engineering is something that's new and emerging. This is where taking electrical, mechanical, chemical, and computer engineering and creating better medical instruments, med better medical tools, better medical therapies for people electronics, robotics. These are all areas within the engineering field that are not, are, are, are not impossible. But by asking the question why, you can conquer them because you know you stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before you and have done it. The, the, the capability is in you and in your hands. Last but not least, math. Algebra, geometry, calculus. I used to find geometry quite easy. Algebra was a challenge, but calculus, oh my gosh. Calculus was, was terrible. But you know what? I learned, I had good teachers who taught me to invest the time, to question what I was doing. Don't simply accept what's given to you, but question it. And in questioning it, you develop your own approach, your own solution, and you learn it. So those are the um, subjects that are important, that are key to a career in either science, technology, engineering, or math. And just a little graphic here. So, we look at the subjects, choosing a career. How do you choose a career in STEM? Well, look at the first tile. It says, you gotta get to know yourself. Asking who you are, why you're here, is probably one of the most fundamental questions that you could, that's probably one of the best questions that you can ask yourself before going on to a career, because by knowing yourself, not everybody is a good mechanical engineer or is a good electrical engineer. Maybe you're better at computer engineering. Once you know that, you can now look at what are the jobs that are out there. So you study, but where are you gonna get the jobs? You have an idea of what the jobs are, then now you move into, edu you know, you go to school. And you study so that you can get the skill for the job. But you don't just study, you excel so that you stand out to employers, so that people want you, not you wanting them. And last but not least, when you're in the job, you stay connected with your profession. You network and you stay connected. You talk to people. You ask people the question, why? Why are you here? 
because by listening to their answers, we are better. We have better examples of, of understanding why we ourselves are here in this profession. What I want to do now, so we've talked a, a, quite a bit there. We've talked about the history of technology engineering, what happened back in Africa. We've looked at the greatness of African Canadians. We've looked a bit at, at my educational path, some of the innovation projects I've been involved in. We've talked about the areas of STEM, the soft skills, communication, the thinking, the reasoning, developing the answers. The, we've talked about a lot about you know, reducing carbon, the, uh, reducing greenhouse gas production in the area of sustainability. But out there, we, we started talking about Engineers Canada as sort of the umbrella, as sort of the head of the stream in engineering. I want to focus more now to the province of Ontario. Each province has a professional engineering body. And what I'm going to do now is to share with you a couple of organizations that I've been involved in and share with you how do they acknowledge diversity and how do they um, relate to diversity? Why is this important? Because in our profession, in the profession of engineering, if your professional groups don't acknowledge you, then you will go nowhere. There is a sense of fairness and ethics that they all claim to practice. And one of the rudiments of that fairness, one of the rudiments of that ethics is the recognition of the type of people that are practicing. So who is the professional engineers of Ontario? They regulate the practice of professional engineering. They serve and protect the public interest by ensuring that all professional engineers meet rigorous qualifications. They in turn recognize, and this is a profound statement, racism and discrimination exist in Canada, in Canadian societies and in its institutions. So it's not us you know, hitting our head against a brick wall saying, look, this is here. The PEO as the provincial regulator recognizes that and puts that in print. And it goes on to say that the PEO is not immune. It also recognizes that there is the possibility of racism and discrimination existing in the engineering field. But it goes on to recognize that it has a responsibility to play a leadership role in instilling respect for human rights principles, whether in the organization or in the wider profession. This is leadership, people. This is where, as an engineer, supported by your professional organization, you can promote human rights in the organization and in the wider engineer profession. Just a note here. Legally, you cannot call yourself an engineer in the province of Ontario unless you are licensed by the professional engineers of Ontario. After you graduate from your, 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 your university or your college with a degree, you have to do four years of internship. And at the end of that four years, you write two exams, one in professional ethics and the other one in engineering law. If your experience over the four years is found to be a good experience and you can prove through the projects you have done that you have learned and have advanced yourself, that you've asked the questions why in a responsible way and you pass the ethics and law exams, then you're granted the, 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 the privilege of putting professional engineer behind your name, P dot eng 
PNs. And that's become a nationally recognized title in Canada. Last but not least, the PEO says, we assert our commitment to implement specific measures as codified, as contained in our anti-racism and equity code to address historical disadvantage and diligently engage in actions as appropriate for a regulator. This last statement could be applied to any organization. It could be applied to any sector of society. Because what do we want to do? We want to address historical disadvantage and we want to engage in actions that are corrective, that move our society forward. So as engineers, we are leaders. We, we stand out because our a profession supports our growth. It supports us as diverse people. It supports our progression and it supports us as leaders. This organization is a world-based, it's the largest technical professional organization in the world. It's called the Institution of Electrical and Electronic, Electronic and Electrical Engineers. It's the world's largest technical professional organization dedicated to advancing technology for the benefit of humanity. Asking the question why such that we can build a more sustainable, safe planet for those around us, for our society. That's what the IEEE is about. I am a senior member of the IEEE. And what does that mean? That means in the world's largest professional organization, I rank among the top 10% of the membership of that organization. And that is a privilege and a recognition that I do not take lightly in my profession. Its core purpose is to follow technology, is to foster technological innovation and excellence for the benefit of humanity. We talked about an evolving technology in our field, in the field, you know, in the field of engineering earlier on. And that's what the IEEE does. It encourages you. How wonderful it is to be able to belong to an organization that through its efforts, through its actions, through its conferences, through the avenues of growth and education that it provides, encourages you as a human being to foster technological innovation and not just be a learned individual, but to be a positive contributor, a contributor of innovation and excellence for the benefit of humanity. And it has its own statement. It says the IEEE is and remains strongly committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And they see no place for hatred and discrimination in our communities, our communities in engineering, our communities in technology. Again, a professional organization, the largest in the world of its kind. It's actually the largest professional organization in the world that comes out in support of diversity, in support of hate, of going against hatred and discrimination. So I, I talked at the beginning about engineers having a dual role. And the IEEE has highlighted that in a very, very good way. Every year as an IEEE, as a senior member of the IEEE, I have to renew my membership. When I renew my membership, myself and the other hundreds and thousands of members of the IEEE, we, we commit them ourselves to the highest ethical and professional conduct. We hold paramount the safety, healthy, health and welfare of the public. We are expected to treat fairly all persons, refrain from acts of discrimination based on race, religion, gender, disability, age, national origin, sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. 
That is a commitment that we have to make. And by the way, every year when you renew your engineering license, you make a similar commitment to this. The IEEE is and remains strongly committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and they see no place for hatred in our community. This commitment and the status of IEEE members as leaders and educators in numerous civic organizations, corporations, schools, and communities obligates us to recognize acts of discrimination, segregation, and bigotry, and to oppose them actively. This is a wonderful thing to have. An organization, a professional organization, the largest of its world, that strives to make the engineering profession one free of acts of discrimination, segregation, bigotry, and to oppose them actively. Wouldn't it be wonderful for those of you out there to consider seriously a career in engineering? knowing that these organizations got your back, that they support what you do, and they are focused on not just making you a good engineering practitioner, but making you a leader in society. Last but not least, National Society of Black Engineers. They have branches in Canada and the US. Their goal is to increase the number of culturally responsible Black engineers who excel academically, succeed professionally, and positively impact the community, who are leaders in the community. NSBE, it um, engages from grade three to grade 12, college, professionally, and internationally. Martin Luther King said, Dr. Martin Luther King, in this Black History Month, the richer we have become materially, the poorer we have become morally and spiritually. We have learned to fly in the air like birds and swim in the sea, like fish, but we have not learned the simple art of living together as brothers. We have not learned the simple art of living together as brothers. We have not asked the question why enough, because in asking the question why, we can answer that question with solutions that support us, that support the simple art of living together as brothers. Last, and I'll leave you with this, we all know Bob Marley, Robert Nesta Marley, that great musician from Jamaica, Someone once asked him, is there a perfect woman? And Bob Marley replied, who cares about perfection? Even the moon is not perfect. It is full of craters. What about the sea? Very beautiful, but very salty and dark in depth. What about the heavens? Also infinite. That is the most beautiful things are not perfect, they are special. Every woman, every man, every human being chooses who is special in his life. He goes on to say, stop trying to be perfect. Better try to be free and live doing what you like without trying to please others. This is a heavy statement. Living, doing what you like without trying to please others. Being able to feel free to ask the question why and being able to feel free to answer that question any which way you feel focused on making our society a better place. People on the call, diversity is a fact. We are here. People of color, we are here. 2L, LGBTQIA+, we are here. Equity is a choice that we should not leave to others. Equity is a choice that we must make, that we must practice. And inclusion is an action that we must be engaged in. Don't leave it to others. It is our responsibility to stand up 
and belonging. We out of all of that, we all feel that we belong to the same profession. In our engineering field, as we are diverse, let us rise to the occasion. Let us ask the question why, build a better planet and make this world a better place. Thank you very much. Well, what can I say? Um, Gary, on behalf of Vaughan Public Libraries, I would like to thank you so very much for your thoughtful presentation on STEM innovation, entrance into the profession, and the very important thing about legacy. Thank you so very much for reminding us the importance of, of legacy. So um, thank you very much. If anybody has a if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask a question. Um, we go until 8.30. So if you would like to say thank you, if you'd like to say something in the chat, or if you would like to um, turn your video on and ask a question. I saw someone with their hands up. I don't know if he's still here, but I'm seeing, <clears throat> I'm seeing some thank yous. Or oh, there's Joaquin, would you like to... Um, Put your video on and you can ask a question if you wish. Having anybody, why haven't anybody told us about, uh, about technological discoveries founded in Africa? Joaquin? Um, so Actually, uh, it's my brother, Mikhail. Okay. So, um, you know, sometimes things are put aside in life by people for various reasons. This is why it's important that as individuals, we ask the question why. Because again, the by knowing that things are hidden, the responsibility is now on us to make them known. So let's not, let's recognize that these things are there. Let's recognize that yes, they've been introduced today. I would encourage you to, 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 to look more. There's a lot more where that came from and spread the word and ask the question why, and come up with solutions and be able to communicate. Don't be shy about communicating those solutions. One of the definitions of innovation is that innovation is actually a circular world. You're actually discovering what was being discovered before, but we're just putting a modern picture to it. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank yeah, you. That does answer my question. That, thank you very much, Joaquim and Gary. Um, okay, so, I'm Mikhail. Joaquim also, is right beside me. Okay, so thank you to both of you. Um, we, ha we have another question. Are there any programs in Ontario for Black youth and young adults who want to transition into STEM field? Yes, there's uh, uh, some of the universities like Toronto Metropolitan University. Um, York University, all these, these schools have scholarships. They provide mentors. Um, they provide um, tour days. So if you are interested in a field of engineering or technology, uh, you can contact these institutions and they'll take you on a tour of the engineering facilities. They'll talk to you. They'll give you free counseling on, you know, subjects, what you need to get involved. Um, they'll point you to other organizations outside. And also the professional engineers of Ontario have programs in elementary and high schools. I was, a, I was for, for a number of years, a tutor in an elementary school providing, um, there's a whole curriculum from grade one right up to grade uh, to grade twelve, 
approved by the Ministry of Education that the Professional Engineers of Ontario actively engage with, it's called the Engineering Residence Program. And through that, we do experiments, we provide mentorship, and we provide guidance to those who want to become engineers. And I would say also reach out to NSBE, National Society of Black Engineers. So their, their programs are there. Uh, people, we're in the internet age. Take leadership, ask the question why, and answer the question. We have that capability to do it. Thank you. So um, we have some other comments here, very informative, and also a comment about enjoying the historical perspective. Um, so another comment, person was late getting on, but the presentation is what is needed. Thank you very much. And some more thank yous. So um, if there are, mm -hmm, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I yes, had my yes. hands up, sorry. Yes. I just wanted to mention that there are a few universities who are actually involved in, in special programs for black, black students. I know Ontario Tech has a program where they do Black STEM Club for, for young girls, grades six to eight or something. They also have other Black STEM clubs. I also know University of Toronto has an outreach program starting from grades nine upwards or lower. So there are a number of the universities are involved in this and they've started very, I also know there was a program for two weeks on campus at the University of Toronto for young black students. So you can investigate. There's quite a, quite a lot of um, universities participating in an encouraging STEM within the black community. But okay. you know, to, on, on that point, Elisha, I just want to jump on that. You know what? And I'm glad you shared that uh, and what that shows is that there is a recognition out there for of us as a people that the people are are providing tools but they're only as good if we sign up mm -hmm. again you're going to be tired of hearing me saying this if we ask the question why and answer that question by getting involved by signing up so um there's a question. I'm not too sure if this was probably answered in the previous um, comment by Magdalene, but here's a question. From your perspective, what's a good place for parents to start getting kids under 10 years old to get into STEAM? Okay, I, I'm very biased here. Go to your local public library. Your local public library is a beehive of activity around STEM. There are books, there are activities, and we are, we are blessed. If you live in the GTA, if you live in Brampton, you can go to the library in Vaughan, you can go to the library in Toronto, you can go to the library in Pickering. All of them have amazing programs. I know, again, I'm biased, I'm, I'm, I'm affiliated with Vaughan Public Libraries, at our city center library, the makerspace that's there, the 3D printing, the, the arts, the, the, the music studio. Um, let's talk about engineering in music, music engineering. All that's there waiting for our, our young people to just come and ask the question why and get involved. So it's free. Libraries are free. We pay for them with our taxpayers' money. Let's use them. I also Sorry, want to, okay. Okay, that's fine. You know, also want to mention that um, that program, the same program for kids, um, is done in partnership with the a, um, Ajax on Pickering Libraries. So there you go. He's correct, he's correct about that, and and also the training is delivered by young black students in the Masters in Engineering program. So. I was quite pleased. I, I dropped in on one of the events, on one of the classes, and I saw those young ladies were talking about being forensic scientists, CSI agents. So that's a whole new wave of, 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 of opportunities that they can start considering at a very young age, and they're given the solid background to do that. So that's in progress. Yes. We should see some change in the next coming years in that area. Yes. 
Okay, well, thank you all for coming out this evening. And um, I hope that you continue to celebrate Black History Month in, in, in positive ways. So um, have a good evening, everyone. And Gary, once again, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for your questions. And don't forget to ask the question, why? Can we have Gary's contact information? Sorry. <laughs> Okay. Sure, Alicia, if you contact Alicia mm -hmm. um, and you give your information to Alicia, she'll she'll give it to me and I'll reach out to you. How's that? Okay, who's and, Alicia? And That's me. Alicia, and okay. you can okay. also look me up on, I'm on LinkedIn. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, Thank I'm on you. LinkedIn. Okay. Thank you. Okay, okay. So yes, Magdalene, I will be in touch, okay? Okay, thank you. Okay, bye. Mm -hmm. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Good you. night.